The trip to Melbourne was a gift to Thomas from his father, Hone. The flight provided through air points and the hotel a belated 35th birthday present. The generosity of his whanau was one of the reasons why Thomas had been able to go back to university. This wasn't something that was ever discussed. Rather, it was an unspoken understanding which Thomas also knew could never be taken for granted. It would be a solstice trip of three days, primarily, as far as his parents knew, to give Thomas a break from his PhD thesis. Six months out from completion, it felt like a dark rain cloud for Thomas, foreboding and omnipresent. He woke mo most mornings with a sense of low-level dread, fearing that the thesis, an exploration of early brain development in Māori children, would expose him as an intellectual and scientific fraud. It's a very important area of study, his mother Elizabeth cooed down the phone to him. You are a pioneer and you must be strong. This had been her mantra to her boy for the last three years. Because this was a budget weekend away, only, only carry-on luggage, luggage was permitted. Thomas went to Strand Bags on Queen Street and bought an electric blue Samsonite overnight bag with wheels, especially for this sojourn. The Japanese shop assistant explained it was the maximum size for carry-on luggage and that it must weigh no more than eight kilos. Remember, only eight kilos. Airlines getting very strict now. Samsonite the best, she called, smiling, her eyes disappearing into the creases of her face as Thomas left the shop. Kia ora, Thomas shouted back, laughing. As he packed his new bag, Thomas, all, Thomas figured that to, sorry, the minimalist economy of the equation appealed to Thomas's left brain tendencies. And on the way up Queen Street to a small apartment on Myers Park, he began to list the necessities for a weekend away. Provided he had a jacket and one warm piece of clothing, he only needed three pairs of socks and underwear, three t-shirts and a pair of jeans, which of course he would be wearing and this would still leave room for his gym gear. Uh, Kia ora everyone, my name's Rob Mokoraka, and uh, actually Anton uh, kindly invited me because I'm also in the Oranui book, but also Anton wanted me to bring part of my new show which I'm developing called Shot Bro, Confessions of a Depressed Bullet. Uh, but actually, it's not fully developed, and the funny thing is we had it done a reading last week, and the key thing that came up from the audience was it didn't have enough of me, because I like to hide, and I'm a writer, and I hide through my characters, and I'm hiding so much that, uh, sorry, Anton, I'm not going to read it, but what I am going to do before I get on to how I was shot in 2009 on the 27th of July, yes, with a meat cleaver and a tea towel, uh, a soup, soup ladle wrapped up in a tea towel. Before I get on to that, basically, what I'd like to talk about the shop, bro, is it's an event that happened to me, and I'm trying to work out an entertaining and enlightening way uh, to talk about depression uh, and what happened to me. So basically, it's not to make it heavy, because I've already lived all the heaviness over the last two and a half years recovering. So, uh, so let me tell you, I was 2009, 27th of July, around about three in the afternoon, and I had this real urge, it's been building for a while, to kill myself. So what I do is I think, who, do, who can I call, who can I call? Oh, yes, I know, 111, easy number to remember. Um, so... Because well, I'm also suppressing, by the way, I'm also suppressing 20 years of pent-up shit that I haven't dealt with. So on this day in particular, on the July 27th, 2009, it's all been coming up and coming up and coming up and coming up. And I get in this crazy relationship, and I think she can save me, but I'm just as crazy as she is, and she's just as crazy as I am. So you've got two people drowning, pulling each other to the bottom of the, uh, of the ocean. So while I'm suppressing 20 years of uh, events in my life, I think, yes, I need to die today. So I call up the police and I start describing to them who this guy is. And there's a guy in my house and he actually looks like me. Oh my God, he's armed. So I'm thinking, yeah, this should get me to where I need to go, which is out of this world at the time. Uh, so I call the cops and yeah, and they're waiting, they're waiting and no one is coming. And then I'm like, man, come on, I'm all prepped. And I think, oh, get changed into a trench coat, very similar to this, but not the actual one. Um, and, you know, I've got, I've got, you know, I'm an actor and I'm a writer. I've got some costumes in my, uh, in my wardrobe. And I go, oh, get dressed in a crazy trench coat, army pants, look mad. Then you'll really die. And so, so all this is done to happen. And I'm like, oh, man, come on, come on, come on. And then I look out the back window and there's a policewoman. And she's climbing over. She's climbing over the fence. And then I'm like, wow, they're coming through. I thought they'd come through the front door. I've got it open. 
Um, but you know, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, I'm sort of, before I uh, continue, the state that I'm in is like Frodo and the ring from Lord of the Rings. It's like, <laughs> so that's how my state of mind is at that time. Uh, and so she's going there and I start going like this. I don't know why. It's like, oh, you shouldn't come around the back. I tapped on the window with my meat cleaver and tuk, tuk, tuk. I said, oh, not, no, not this way. <laughs> and she went, oh, shit, jump back over the fence. He's seen me. And I go, man, they should be coming through the door any moment because I need to get off this planet. I need to get out of my head. The pain in my head is so intense. <laughs> Got the ring on. Um, so finally they don't come, so I throw a bottle out in the road, and I think, yeah, smash, that should, they should come in. No, turn the radio up, because I've seen it on films. You turn the stereo up, and he's crazy, the music's loud, bottles come out, still no one. So finally I'm like, man, I really need to die right now at the time. Uh, not now. Uh, so just checking, just checking, just checking. Uh, so I go out, and so I've got this meat cleaver, and I've got the soup ladle, which I've wrapped up in a tea towel. And I'm going out, and I'm going, man, where are these guys? What I didn't know in my Lord of the Rings Frodo moment is that they'd actually blocked off the street, and the street had been blocked off. And I saw two cops, and one was in behind a police car, and one was behind a tree. And I'm thinking, this is it. I really need to get off this planet right now. This is it. <sighs> Prepare yourself. You're going to go. It's going to be all over. You're going to get rid of the pain in your head. And then the guy speaks to me, and he's a cop, and he's, they're both, oh, by the way, they both got Glock 9mm pointed at me, just a minute, because I'm looking a little bit crazy at the moment. Fair enough. Uh, and I did call them, so yeah. Uh, so, you know. So he's going, okay. And then the guy speaks, pointing his gun at me from behind the tree, and he goes, Rob. Oh, no, no, he doesn't say my name. I'll go back one sec. He goes, what's going on? Are you all right, mate? And I was like, he's South African. What's he doing? Huh? It's, not, it's, not, am I, it's not how I pictured this. He goes, what's going on, mate? Come on, put the gun down. Is that the gun? And he goes, what's your name? And I went, oh, Rob. And he's like, Rob, oh no, he always knows my name. <laughs> Rob, it's okay, Rob, we've all had a bad time in life. You know, why don't you put it down and just come inside and have a chat? And I say, oh, he's so nice. Arr, damn you. Arr. And then the guy is by the car, the cop who is covering him behind the police car is like lining me up, lining me up. And then finally they come on, come on, let's get out of here, man. My head is just crazy. I'm a Lord of the Rings road. And then finally they said, what's in the tea towel? I went, bingo, this is it. In the tea towel, I'm going to be laden full of bullets. Uh, and then I said, you know what? And they said, don't take another step. I went, cool, this is the time to take another step because I want to get out of here. The pain in my head is like crazy. So I take another step and I raise the tea towel with the, wrapped around the soup ladle and pop, hit the deck. And that's when I realized I'd made a very terrible mistake. Uh, it was really terrible with the fact that um, that bullet ripped through my organs. My brain couldn't comprehend what the body was, was feeling and what the heck was going on. And uh, I went, all of a sudden, all my problems that I thought I had or I did have or whatever was not enough to get a shot. Uh, so I'm freaking out. I'm on the ground. I'm in so much pain. Uh, and the body can't, and the brain are freaking out. They're just like, what the hell is this pain? We've never felt this before in my life. So I kindly asked the police officer to shoot me in the head so I could just get out of it. It's so, so painful. So, oh, well, he's not doing that. Okay. Um, so finally the ambulance arrived. You know, this is 20 years of suppressing shit because I didn't talk to anyone and no one told me that it was okay to talk. Uh, and if they did, maybe I ignored them a million times. So I'm in the, and I'm in the ambulance now, and I'm handcuffed on there going, ah, ah, oh, this is really sore. No shit. Um, <laughs> fuck, it's really sore. I don't recommend it. Um, yeah, just maybe talk about it a little bit easier. Um, so I get to the, the hospital, and I'm still handcuffed, and they're like bleeding. And then um, the nurses go, oh, God, I think you should take those handcuffs off. I don't think you can do anyone any harm. All right. All right. I'm sorry. Can't get up off that. And take the handcuffs off. And I go, ah, ah, fuck, this is painful. No shit. Um, and then I black out just as they rip my clothes off. And then I wake up in the hospital bed with all these drips and beeping machines around me. And all I can think about is, oh, my God. I hope my dad doesn't know. <laughs> Fuck. I was really worried my dad would know about it, or anyone. What I didn't realize, because I was in my Frodo Lord of the Rings mode at that time, was that there was a camera caught the last piece of it was on the news. And that news went all around everybody. Some, my friend in Africa heard about it. Uh, so it went a little bit further than I thought. 
Uh, and so, yeah, and I'm going, fuck, ah, shit, ah. Um, and then uh, finally, they, you know, I've got police in the room just in case I jump out and become like some amazing werewolf vampire. Uh, but no, I'm still lying on the bed, go, doot, doot, doot. Um, uh, yeah, I know, hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so they do three operations on me, by the way. The first operation is they cut me right up here and they crack the ribs open and they're trying to find the bullet, which they cannot seem to find, goddammit. And then they sew me back up. And what I'm doing is having internal shit going on. And basically, I know this sounds crazy, but it's the most present I had been for almost probably two, three years. I was very present in the moment because I like to escape a lot of to avoid my 20 years of issues. So I'm in this immense pain, but I've never felt so alive at the same time. Uh, and finally, after the second operation, uh, they still can't find the goddamn bullet. So they take the bullet out. Oh, no, they give me a shit bag, sorry, colostomy bag, because the bowels are so damaged. And, um, and then anyway, I get the saw back, and I got the saw back, and I go to the doctor, the saw, and she goes, oh, it's just a drainage uh, thing we put in you know, last time. You know, you've got heaps of drainage holes all over you. So basically, they drain this thing one day, and this doctor is hot. She's Rarotongan. They drain, she's really hot. I want to marry her. But apparently she's already married. Doesn't want to go up crazy guys with me cleavers. Um, so she goes, oh, I'll drain this pus out. And she's draining the pus out. I'm in so much pain. You're like, it's a constant thing. So I'm, that makes me present. I don't like it, but it's just happening. And then she goes, oh, did they ever find that bullet? And I went, oh, no. And she goes, oh, I'm going to have to give you some more painkillers. So she pulls out. Finally, she goes, I think I've got it. And she pulls it out. By the way, at this time, I'm playing James Brown really loud because she told me to turn it right up. So that's when I knew it was going to be painful. And then she pulls it out, and I go, oh, show me. I go, wow, oh, my God, I love you even more. Um, thanks a lot. But they had to, she goes, I'm going to send you down x-ray. I'm down to x-ray. And then waiting down x-ray, uh, as a detective going, uh, do you have that bullet there, Robert? And I was like, oh, you doctor, got it? I don't know, I'm wasted. And he goes, well, we've got to collect the bullet. Uh, it's just a standard procedure. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, hilarious, yeah. Um, so, basically, what I'm alluding to, because I didn't really rehearse this much. <laughs> I thought it would just be on tap because I lived it. Uh, is that all this pain uh, came from having pent up shit in my life for 20 years, you know? Uh, and also, I've, after talking to a psychologist who came into the room to go, no, Robert, would you like to talk about, I just cried my ass off. And I knew what it was straight away. It was like three abortions from 16, 18, 25, and never telling anybody. Uh, it's about the way my mind thought all the time, and I told them exactly how my mind thought in my depressive state. Uh, and they went, oh, you know, Robert, uh, that's not normal. <laughs> I went, fuck, I knew it! <laughs> but I didn't. But I knew something. Uh, and just to have that validated that uh, this crazy guy, this guy who'd been living with depression, who thought the way, I thought crazy thoughts, I still do, but now I make it into art. Um, uh, just, yeah, basically, I'm here just to talk about, uh, I'm very proud, uh, first of all, to uh, introduce my body to a Glock 9 millimeter bullet and to wake up and finally go, fuck, I need to talk about some shit. And I didn't, so now I have been doing it for the last three years. Of course, you better start talking about it, Rob, because everyone's watching, your family, your friends, and wondering if you're going to get through this. And now I've written a play, well, in the development of Shop Bro. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Cool. And this is also just a test to see if I'll do this in the real show. <laughs> so anyway, kia ora, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to read, sorry, I should have, when I was reading my piece out the front there, I should have explained that it's, um, I think it's going to be a novella, so there's little chapters um, that, that I'll read tonight. And the first bit was, uh, Thomas was in Auckland and um, getting ready for his weekend in Melbourne. And... Um, this is his first meeting of the woman that he's been talking to um, over internet dating. Her name's Claudette. Claudette arrived shortly after seven wearing a navy pea coat, a camel cashmere scarf, and tight knee-high black leather boots. 
The photos she had sent Thomas were flattering, her face bathed in warm, iridescent light, her smile luminous. When they Skyped, Claudette's face looked unnaturally large and moon-shaped, however. And here she was in real life, obviously the same woman, but infinitely more human, more beautiful, and slightly flustered. Thomas's heart rate quickened as he raised his hand and smiled. Hello, Thomas, Claudette said as she held both of his hands and kissed him on the left and right cheek. Thomas hugged her tightly and whiffed her flurry, musky scent, floral musky scent. His hand shook as he pulled a chair for, Claudine, for, for Claudette out from under the table. Well, Thomas coughed lightly, am I what you expected? What a strange way to open the conversation, Claudette responded with a small smile. I'd have to say yes. So far, you're good looking and you give off a nice warm vibe. What about me? Am I what you expected? You're not what I expected, no, Thomas replied, but I like what I see. Well then, Claudette said, pursing her lips lightly and opening the menu. To be honest, I'm nervous, Thomas said. I'm not, Claudette answered. I am completely realistic and relaxed about this. We are adults and we have taken a risk which may or may not work. Claudette told Thomas she would order food, not because she was controlling, mind you, she waggled her index finger at Thomas as if to say tut tut, but she knew the menu like the back of her hand. Claudette rested comfortably in Thomas's gaze with the reassurance of a woman aware of her own aesthetic. She reminded Thomas of pictures he'd seen of a young Grace Kelly. It's great to get out of Auckland. That place was starting to close in on me, Thomas said. I don't think I'm handling the pressure of my PhD very well. I'm three months out from finishing and there are days when I can't think of anything to write. I admire anybody who studies at that level, Claudette said. Have you thought that there might be some self-sabotage going on now that you're almost at the finish line? Isn't procrastination the disease of the writer, Thomas asked rhetorically. It's a weird thing, I feel so good when I actually do it, but I'll find so many ways to avoid it. I think I was more focused when I started. Well, you're here now, so enjoy the break. I've been thinking about things we can do together. Hopefully, by the time you go, you'll feel completely rejuvenated. My parents don't know that I've come to meet you, Thomas said. I told them I wanted a few days to myself to read and to look at Aboriginal art. I saw this amazing exhibition of Sally Gabori in Auckland. Hey, but I think I told you that, Thomas said, hitting his forehead dramatically with the palm of his hand. You did tell me, Claudette said, and I've been doing my research. There are a few places we can go. Are you feeling more relaxed now? Definitely, Thomas said as his cheeks flushed. And like you said, this is an experiment. If we don't like one another's company, we can cut loose. My father always used to say to me, make haste slowly, Claudette said. Anyway, I'm famished, so let's order. <laughs> 